Hey everyone, welcome to Internal Medicine Lecture Series. Uh, this is Dr. Shanawaz. I'm an internal medicine doctor, and today we're going to be talking about breast cancer screening. So the question always uh, often arises, uh, when is the right time to recommend breast cancer screening in women? Now, there's no one-size-fits-all answer to this issue, and the reason is that there are risk-to-benefit ratios of performing screening uh, and these risk-benefit ratios are a spectrum that changes with the patient's age and risk factors. So, for example, a, a group of young women in their 20s without risk factors will have extremely low incidences of breast cancer. And so screening this age group will result in a very high number of false positives. And therefore, you could argue that screening those group of patients did more harm than good. Now, as physicians, we all sort of understand the phenomena of false positives, and we also understand that they result not only in added healthcare costs, but also add to anxieties of our patients as well, because they come with unnecessary, uh, what we ultimately find are unnecessary follow-up biopsies. Uh, and, and that's uh, you know something that does not just uh, uh, increased cost, but also results in a lot of anxiety and, and discomfort and pain, and, um, and it, it's not something to be taken trivially. However, there's also another uh, issue of something called overdiagnosis, all right? And so in the context of breast cancer, when we say overdiagnosis, we're referring to the detection of breast cancer in women that would not have caused increased morbidity or mortality were they not found at all. And the way that we measure this is that we compare a group of women who do get regular screening with another group of women who don't. And then we follow both groups for the long term and we find out how much more cancer was found because of the screening. Now, since clinically significant breast cancer would ostensibly present itself in the long term, we would expect the rate of breast cancer to equilibrate between both groups. But if the screen group seems to have a higher percentage of cancers detected, the conclusion is that it diagnosed incidences of cancer that were not clinically relevant and didn't result in a morbidity or mortality benefit. And so there's, uh, for example, uh, a, a relatively elderly female, say 70 years old, who was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, and went through uh, perhaps the biopsy and then subsequent treatment as well, but then ended up dying of, you know, say, uh, heart failure, um, to, you know, uh, and, and, you know, you could have argued that she would have died of that, uh, and it wouldn't have been the cancer that killed her. Uh, there are also examples of, you know, very small nidi of cancer that just spontaneously uh, involute, uh, and uh, that probably happens, you know, in multiple places in the body that, you know, we, we're not aware of because we're not looking so closely. Uh, but it, you know, it's it's evident in um, in breast cancer sort of screening because we have the most body of evidence when it comes to cancer screening uh, in the uh, the work that we've done in breast cancer. Um, so the age and risk factors at which a patient would have more benefit than risk of being screened uh, as part of a screening regimen is a very important consideration. And so the first thing that you need to do as a clinician for your patient is you need to assess the patient's lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And broadly speaking, we divide patients into sort of two buckets, uh, average risk and high risk. Uh, so those are the two groups of patients that we have the clearest guidelines and data for. Now, there's also an intermediate risk or moderate risk group as well, but the screening uh, guidelines are pretty much the same for the moderate or intermediate risk groups and the low, or sorry, the average risk group. Uh, and so there's really no uh, utility, I think, in, in talking about that group. So uh, the, the two main buckets are average risk, which we treat a particular way, and then high risk, which we treat a particular way. So it clearly makes sense to understand what we mean when we say, you know, a high risk patient, you know, what does that exactly mean? Uh, a patient is deemed high risk. So first of all, we've arbitrarily defined high risk as someone who has a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 20% or more. Um, and then how do we figure out this, this percentage? And um, we, we have models. Uh, one way we try is we uh, use what's called the Gale model, which is easily available online. You, you basically just Google Gale model and breast cancer, and it will probably be the first hit that you get. And it takes some very specific factors and, and jumbles them together to come up with a score 
uh, which is a five to 10 year score and then a lifetime score as well. And the factors that it considers are age, race, uh, age of menarche, uh, number of children born and family history of first degree relatives. So it takes all of those things and it pops at a number. Now, uh, if the number, of course, is more than 20 percent uh, lifetime risk, then that is a high risk individual. Uh, and then you treat accordingly. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, one of the things to understand, though, with the Gale model is that it's not for all um Comers, there's going to be some instances where you it, it, the the model doesn't really work very well, and and those two instances are patients who have ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, and patients who have a strong family history. And strong family history could mean a first-degree relative, like a, a mother or a sister who had it, uh, uh, especially if they had it at a young age. Uh, then in that case, you don't want to use the Gale model. And it could also be a strong family history. It could also be multiple family members in the maternal line. So it could be a, a cousin or it could be an aunt, but multiple family members. Um, uh, that would also constitute a strong family history. So in those sort of situations, you don't use Gale models. There are other models that try to assess the risk of BRCA mutations. So then you can go and test for BRCA mutations. Uh, two models that are used are the CAN risk model and the uh, tire QZEC models. Now those are uh, more complex. Uh, they're basically software you have to download and install in your computer and uh, you end up getting certain values when you plug in all the parameters that it asks for. Uh, so those models you can use for uh, to, to figure out if a patient has uh, the risk of uh, BRCA mutations. Now, say that you end up uh, with a patient with BRCA mutations. One of the, the things to consider is if resources allow for it, uh, depending on where you practice, uh, there may be in your area a clinic that specifically deals with patients who, have a hi who are high risk uh, for breast cancer, uh, so basically patients with BRCA mutations. So those kind of clinics are uh, more experienced in dealing with high-risk individuals, and they can also do, uh, besides genetic testing, they can also do uh, counseling uh, when it comes to things like uh, prophylactic uh, mastectomies or prophylactic self uh in order to mitigate risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, which uh, BRCA mutation patients have as well. Now, but if you are dealing with a BRCA mutation uh, patient, then... Um, MRI of the breast actually is uh, an adjuvant modality that's uh, used as well, uh, yeah, but it's used in conjunction with the mammogram. So you would still use a mammogram along with the MRI. And there's also been talk of using um, mammograms with uh, tomograms. Um, so that's basically like a 3D kind of x-ray. The, it's the same sort of principle as a CAT scan, but not not quite. You, just, you have some extra slices of breast tissue. Uh, you have some extra planes of breast tissue in the imaging that you can look at uh, and uh, whereas you know most mammograms are just sort of two-dimensional there's there's only one image um, so you would you can use MRIs um, and uh, you also use uh, mammograms with or without tomography um, now the starting age is as young as 25 uh, but it can be uh, younger so if uh, 25 is a starting age but if the patient for example has a sister who is 20 and that sister was diagnosed with breast cancer then you know you start at 20 uh, and you do this every six months um, so that's how you deal with a high-risk patient now you know that's the minority of patients the majority of patients about 90 percent are average risk they're the average risk category and uh, again it's arbitrarily somewhat arbitrarily defined as uh, a risk of less than 15 times uh, sorry 15 percent lifetime risk of breast cancer so that is what the uh, sort of lifetime risk is if it's less than 15 your average risk now in these patients those who are under 40 years of age do not need to be screened for breast cancer and a lot of the uh, medical associations and government bodies sort of have a widespread consensus and again this is an average risk uh, patient so not really no no significant family history and, and nothing else that sort of makes them high risk either uh, remember, uh, an another criteria for high risk as well is radiation therapy um, for someone who was uh, in a, t a teenager, say from Hodgkin's lymphoma or, you know, someone in their early 20s, for example. Uh, but if they don't have any risk, they're average. Then if they're less than 40, there's no need to screen them. There's way too many false positives. And like we said, you know, you'd be doing more harm than good in that case. Now, what about for women in their 40s? Now, that is one of those... Um, 
age groups about where the decision to screen is not straightforward. So in some countries like Australia and Canada, screening in the early 40s is not recommended at all. And uh, the decision is, um, uh, in, in other countries like the United States, the decision of whether or not to do uh, screening on a patient in their 40s is determined after educating the patients about the risks of false positives. Remember, overdiagnosis is a risk as well, right? And then proceeding only if the patient is keen to do so based on her own subjective sense that the benefit would be worth whatever potential risks are, right? So that you could be dealing with a patient who, you know, uh, does just does not want to take a risk. They're happy to have, you know, uh, false positives and then go down that false positive rabbit hole of biopsies and even potential therapy, et cetera. Um, they're okay with that. Uh, they would just rather not risk breast cancer because, you know, maybe they just have a fear of it, uh, you know, because of personal experience. Uh, a friend, for example, died. I mean, something like that. Uh, or their own personal value uh, system, you know, uh, uh, demands that they be screened as uh, early as possible. And uh, if, if they do want to be screened, then that early as possible date for average risk patients is 40 years of age. Um, now, uh, for women who are over uh, 40, um, uh, it's uh, sorry, over 50, uh, the uh, screening is definitely recommended, and uh, and and this uh, again, the uh, the guidelines are very clear. Um, the frequency is about every one to two years. Some societies recommend yearly, others recommend every two years, uh, but th that's sort of how you go. And you go all the way up to age 75, all right? So uh, from uh, 50 to 75, uh, mammograms every one year or two years is the recommendation.